course. Oh, thanks so much, Glenn, for the uh, privilege of service. My name is Ed, and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, it's great to be here once again. I think it was probably maybe three or four years ago, near the, I guess, the height of the pandemic when I spoke last. And it's wonderful then, and it's wonderful now. It's good to meet all of you, or wherever you are in your recovery, wherever we all are. And uh, my, my hometown, London, Ontario, Canada, just a couple hours south of Toronto and a couple hours north of Detroit. And my home group, Design for Living, which is an online group much like this. And we meet uh, seven days a week at 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. Eastern every single day. And every meeting is a, a literature focused and singleness of purpose focused. And then the Saturday night, we have a speaker and uh, that's, a, that's a fun evening. So uh, date of my last drink, thankfully, July 30th, 1988. And for that, I owe AA and my loving God my life. Uh, I don't take that for granted. I, uh, I I was a daily drinker for about 10 years. Uh, just drank over anything and everything. And I, I just could not stop. So I specifically, I want to welcome the newcomer, someone, anyone who's new or coming back to this way of life that's designed for living. And uh, it, it works here. <laughs> it works very, very well. Your search is over. Uh, we get we get right down to root here, not just symptom. And uh, there's a real camaraderie here. There's a real friendliness. Uh, we uh, we we tend to feel a lot alike. We tend to think a lot alike. We've done a lot of the same stuff. We finish each other each other's sentences. And uh, I uh, I had no clue how to live before I came to you, none at all. And I had searched. <laughs> it wasn't through lack of effort. <laughs> I really tried. So. Uh, I'm going to share, yeah, in a general way what I used to be like and what happened and what I'm like now. And uh, here we go. Let's see what we got. Well, I, you know, when I think about what I was like, I, I think about, you know, before I drank, I think about my childhood and I could sum it up in, in one word. There's a, a whole bunch of things that went on, but the major thing that went on for me is that I was afraid. I didn't know what is fear. I didn't know what it was. I just knew it didn't feel very good. When I, when I came into the fellowship and, and started to do the work, I, I started to realize what these feelings were and how to, what to do with them, you know, and uh, to work through them. Uh, I had no clue. I just, I was afraid most of the time, very much afraid most of the time. And uh, I, I came from an environment where there was a lot of uh, anger, a lot of, uh, sometimes it was very volatile, uh, sometimes it was violent. It was always tense. Uh, there's never resolution, and I mean never. I use that word. It, it, it's it's what it was. It never resolution to conflict, so conflict was avoided. Feelings weren't discussed, and there's no fault here. It's just what it was, and uh, you know I, I, yeah, that's just just the way it was. Now that doesn't make me alcoholic at all. There there's people that come from that background and don't become alcoholic. There's no blame for my alcoholism. There's no blame for anything. I can't afford that and. I don't believe in it. Uh, but uh, what what makes me alcoholic is when I discovered alcohol, those feelings, all those feelings that were uncomfortable, just evaporated, just disappeared uh, quite quickly and effectively. And uh, that's why I drank. It worked. You know, it, and if it would have continued to work, you'd have a different speaker. I'd, I'd be doing what was working. Uh, so that's... Uh, yeah, that's that's what happened with me. So I, you know, I, I felt disconnected from. I felt less than. You know, uh, I felt um, uh, less than for sure. And it was um, it, it was not not good, <laughs> not good at all. And I discovered alcohol at the age of fifteen, and it just took care of everything. Like it just it it just uh, it was my answer. It was never my problem. It seemed to me. So I, you know, I, I didn't like the way I looked in pictures. I really, really didn't like that at all. Uh, I didn't, I really quite uncomfortable having my picture taken and uh, hearing my voice on an answer machine or tape recorder, very uncomfortable. Uh, I was quite skinny and uh, self-conscious of my appearance and uh, yeah, didn't look anyone in the eye either. So uh, I had my first drink at age 15 and I remember it like it was yesterday. You know, that was 45 years ago, but I remember the way I felt. I remember what it did for me and what it did. It just, it seemed to complete me. It seemed to uh, get rid of all those uncomfortable feelings. 
Uh, and my, my first thought was, is where have you been my whole life? You know, 15 year old boy, where have you been my whole life? And I, I remember what I was doing. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't remember that sensation with any other liquid. <laughs> like it doesn't matter what the other liquid is, the other drink. Don't remember that sensation, but with alcohol, yeah, there was something profound, you know, it was something big and I was at it right away. You know, I was, I, 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 it was the best I could come up with, you know, so I did whatever I had to do. And so I, I get that, you know, how they say, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, I call that step zero. You know, it's a two question step and they're both, both questions are yes or no questions. And I always pose that question to, to the guys that asked me to sponsor them. And, and I need to pose that question to myself on a regular basis too. You know, just uh, the willingness has been key for me. So, uh, you know, it, it, just like I was willing to go to any lengths to drink for 10 years, the, the willingness to, to get and stay sober has been absolutely crucial. And that was the missing ingredient in my first attempt, which I'll get into shortly, my first attempt at recovery. So, yeah, I uh, just uh, the way I drank was quite simply, uh, I, I didn't, I've never had one drink. I've never had just one drink in a sitting it was always multiple and it was uh once i started to drink there was no stopping it i couldn't stop after say the the second or third or fifth uh i didn't uh i wasn't concerned with things like drink temperature or ice cubes or the strength of the drink or any of that stuff i i just needed to change the way i felt and it was uh it was medicine for me you know so uh you know, I, I didn't like the taste of it at first, but I grew to like the taste of it. And, uh, you know, people talk about it being the taste. Well, I, I like the taste of Coca-Cola, but I've never had a case of Coca-Cola in a sitting. There's something else in that alcohol. So once I started to drink it, once it's in my body and the craving was activated, like Silkworth talks about, for me, there were only things, three things that would stop me. And that would be I'd have to run out of money or run out of alcohol uh, or pass out. That was the uh, amount of choice I had with alcohol. And uh, I know that, uh, I mean, thank goodness the, the obsession's gone. But if for whatever reason I drank again today, no desire to, that that craving would be just like it was back then. I've seen so many of our members go back out. And, uh, and like I said, I didn't get it the first time either. Uh, I didn't really give it a good attempt, but... So, you know, what I learned is I don't want to run out of money or run out of booze. I, uh, the only, so the only thing left is pass out. So I did most of my drinking late at night or well into the evening. And I drank rather urgently and quickly. <laughs> so I, I'd have large amounts in a short period of time and then pass out. And the next, you know, I might throw up or whatever next morning I'd, I'd be, uh, I'd come to hungover. And, uh, the hangovers weren't so severe in the first couple of years, but as I got into my, you know, later teens, early twenties, the hangovers were severe. And I never really knew about the morning drink. I like as a, you know, hair of the dog thing. Um, I also had this feeling that, you know, how there's, uh, you know, you know, how we look at it, what is an alcoholic and a lot of alcoholics are looking for the definition that, that lets them out, you know, the loophole, right? So I had all these ideas that, well, if I had a morning drink, I'd have a problem. So I don't, I won't have a morning drink. Um, you know, if I had a, if I had a, like a two, four in, in my house at all times, I, I, I lived alone or I drank alone most of the time, I've got a problem. So I bought a bunch of quarts, like a lot of quarts, cost a lot more money that way. And it was a lot noisier. They clanked in the corner a lot, my poor roommate. But I had all these ideas, you know, that if, if it's this, I'm an alcoholic, so I won't do that. And I crossed all those boundaries over time. So, yes, any any links. I saw things just slowly start to deteriorate in my life. Uh, friendships. Uh, uh, I didn't know how to process feelings or resolve conflict or work through it. Uh, I was uncomfortable with, with strong emotions. And uh, I, I just drank at everything, you know. Uh, and my marks went from 90s. I even had a couple of hundreds in high school, early high school, down to 50s. Uh, I didn't go to class. And I was drunk at class sometimes too. I, you know, last if last period last period English in my final grade of high school, I was drunk the whole the whole semester. You know, I'd go for a liquid lunch and 
wondered why I got a 69 in a course I'd normally get an 85 then, you know. And for me, I, oh, it's the the teacher is just a, a bitter actor who didn't make it, you know. And <laughs> never mind that the student is drunk all the time. So, uh, and I, I just saw my report card recently. I was going through some old stuff. And he said, Ed would do better if he didn't have so many, some extra curricular activities. I think that's the way he put it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I watched my, my dreams start to, to fall apart as I got into my 20s. And um, I, I, my energy and my ambition decreased. Uh, I couldn't bounce back like I used to. I always had this question going on even before my first drink, you know, which was this this gnawing feeling. And it's a it's a feeling a lot of alcoholics have, a lot of people that have this spiritual malady of whatever sort. And it's a simple question. Maybe some people in this room have the, the question or the, the feeling, what's wrong with me? You know, there's something fundamentally wrong that I can't seem to connect with people. And, uh, you know, I just, I couldn't get that connection. And I tried all sorts of ways. There was that in 12 and 12 in step five, Bill talks about, like, he just, I identify with Bill so much. So many of his lines, I proved to the world I was important. You know, that was one of his lines. You know, and I was lonely, and, and then again, and again, turned to alcohol, you know. And he talked his grandiosity, how, you know, his his talents, he thought, would, he didn't, it manage the, uh, the largest corporations with the utmost of confidence or something to that effect, you know. I get that. But, um you know, when I lost my train of thought there, but I, um, yeah, yeah. So I, uh, the, the drinking just, just, uh, it was first place, you know, and, and we hear that, that acronym sometimes that slip as sobriety loses its priority. And I get that, you know, I, I prefer to call it a relapse, but whatever, but sobriety loses its priority and, and sobriety is its first place. It, it needs to be first place. Um, it's, there's nothing, it's game over if I were to drink, but I mean, the, the beauty about that is, uh, you know, I'll go back to the fact that the obsession was removed. It doesn't matter what happens in my life. The idea to drink doesn't even come up that, and I'm not being boastful. I, I really, I'm not, I'm, it was removed. It was removed from me, from my loving God. And I, I asked for it and it was provided. So I have a, a debt that I could never repay. I mean, it was a central part of my life was that that obsession to drink, and now uh, now it's 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 been gone for decades. So, how could I ever repay that? Well, I well I can't. So I just try to to pay it forward as best I can, you know. Um, yeah. So the end of my drinking, uh, I I came into recovery the first time in '87, and there was a a real humiliation, a public humiliation, and. Uh, it was not the first one. Uh, something similar happened a couple of years earlier with a different group of people, but this one uh, really got my attention and it scared me. It really scared me. So I, uh, it was in front of my peers and, you know, so I, I went to see a doctor and it wasn't my family doctor. It was just another doctor. I was in a different city and I told her everything about my drinking and I'd never done that before. And uh, it well, it was the humiliation plus the fact she was not someone I didn't even know. So I, I told her everything, and she she didn't even hesitate. She said, "You've got a problem, you know. It sounds like alcoholism or something to that effect." And she said, "I can't help you, but I know who can." And I'm ever so grateful that she said those two things. She had the humility, just like Silkworth had the humility to say he didn't understand the the spiritual life, but he had respect for it. You know, and, and she had the humility to say, I can't help you, but I know who can. And she gave me a phone number in that town. Um, and, you know, I think about that. How did she know about AA? Now, she might have known, one of her patients might have disclosed. And that's an an anonymity break at the appropriate level, the non-public level. That makes us more useful to others, you know, that, that the level that I break it at, my own anonymity, the non-public level. Yeah, so... Uh, so maybe she found out that way, or maybe she found out through, uh, you know, where we send our contributions to to New York or area or district, you know, uh, public information. And uh, so maybe she found out in nursing school or doctor school, who knows.
but she knew and I'm glad she got the information because that was that was crucial. Now, I wasn't quite ready. <laughs> But I mean, I, I went and I saw a member and I, I, you know, I gave the code phrase, are you a friend of Bill W's? And she smiled and said, yeah, good to meet you. And I, I didn't know anything, of, anything about Bill W. I didn't know anything about anything. But, but uh, the, the initial smile and bringing me to the first meeting. Uh, but I, one, of the, one of the things is uh, there's, I was supposed to have a, a liver test. My eyes were going yellow. They're starting to go yellow. And the doctor was concerned about my liver. It came back okay. It wasn't uh, wasn't so wasn't at least it wasn't bad enough. My first thought was to myself, "Oh, good, I can drink some more." Now that's just that's nuts. I was twenty three at the time, and uh, the other thing that where where I knew I wasn't ready, I had a forty ounce of Canadian Club in my room, and I had a friend come into my room, and I said, "You can have it." Now I had never given away alcohol in my entire life. It's too important. <laughs> like you don't give that stuff away. That's gold. I give anything else away, but not alcohol. But I, I, uh, I gave him the half bottle of of Canadian Club. So, but just before I did that, just before he came into my room, I looked at the bottle up on the shelf, and I actually said to the bottle out loud, "I said, I got you beat." That's chilling. And if I would have listened carefully, I would have heard it say back, "You think so, eh?" It said A because it's Canadian clubs. So I, I, I wasn't ready. I just wasn't ready, you know. So I, I went to a few meetings. I remember my very first meeting. I remember the feeling of that first meeting. I don't remember what was said or who said it or faces or names. I just remember the feeling. And the feeling was that I was welcome, that there were no conditions for me to be there. People were glad I was there. People wanted me to come back. And they were falling over each other to help me. And they, they, I was trying to figure out what the angle was. Really, I, I thought it was too good to be true. So maybe you're new here and you're wondering, is this too good to be true? I mean, there's got to be something here. What are they getting out of this? No, it's not too good to be true. There is no angle. I didn't have anything to give to anyways. Like, no one wanted what I had. So, <laughs> you know, but people are just, just so kind. And, and I... I owe that going forward. I I just do. Very very attractive, you know. And that that's the kind of stuff that stuck in my head uh, in the next year when things got bad again, because I didn't do the work. So I went to a few meetings, and then I made a decision. And after about it was after about maybe uh, a month and a half of meetings, I went back to I was in music school at, in university, and I went back and I said I'm I'm quite busy, don't you know, and. It's really simple. If you're alcoholic, if alcohol is your problem, don't drink. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if, if you have a problem with something, just don't do that anymore. I didn't understand the cunning, baffling, powerful. I didn't understand the root. I didn't understand that this wasn't a paper cut, that this isn't just a little, little cold or something, that this was insidious. It was truly cunning, baffling, powerful. Uh, I didn't give it its proper respect. I underestimated it. So I, I just said, I'll, I'll just not drink and I'll do it on my own. I'll, I thought the problem was lack of effort and lack of information. And they talk about that in the book over and over again, thank goodness, and uh, making the point that, that self-knowledge would not fix it. Fear won't fix it. You know, effort won't fix it. So, uh, and I was the hardest trying guy you ever saw. Like, I, I really. So uh, I, I went about my business and I had a year, almost a year, of not drinking and not going to meetings. And it was the worst year of my life. And it was the worst year up till then. It's the worst year since then. It, it's horrible. And it was, so what made it horrible? You know, I before I had been afraid. But now I was panic stricken. You know, before I was resentful. But now I was bitter. You know. And when I went back to drinking, which I did, of course, I, that's what had to happen for me, the, the drinking didn't solve the bitterness. It wouldn't cut through the bitterness. And then I was really scared. You know, so I, I you know, I, it was nine or ten months I went not drinking, not going to AA, and then, then out came the bottle. And there's a story in, in the big book, the, the Man of 30, and out came the bottle and the carpet slippers. There's a woman from Atlanta, Leslie S., she, she calls him carpet slipper dude. And I, so I, every time I think of him, I think of her and, and I smile. 
I, I didn't really have any carpet slippers, but I'll tell you, I came in the bottle and there was no gradualness. There's there's no ramp up. It was all of a sudden back right where I left off. I was just drinking to oblivion. And now I'm in a lot of trouble because, you know, not drinking didn't work and drinking wasn't working. I was a mess, whether I had alcohol in me or not. I was angry. I was afraid. I was lonely. I was suicidal. I was even homicidal. I was so angry. I'm not a violent guy, but I had these thoughts going around in my head because of my level of resentment. I, I couldn't process anything and just so, so angry. Dragging my body through the, the streets of Montreal and uh, trying to be as normal as I could. And I came back to you in July of 88. And when I came back, there was only one difference. Actually, before I go to that, you know how I talked about that, you know, I had that idea, what's wrong with me? Well, now back drinking again after so dryety, I had another question, which was what's going to become of me? Yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be good. There's no way this could end well. It was going in the wrong direction and it was going down fast. So um, I came back to you and uh, I said, just born of desperation, complete. I, like I, I thought I could live another 60, 70 years like this. I, I can't even live another day like this. I can't make any sense of it. See, I had, so I tried the dryness. Uh, I tried, uh, I tried non-alcoholic beer even at one point. I tried hypnotism. You know, I, I tried all sorts of stuff, willpower, you know, and I, I just knew I was, I was in trouble. So I, I came back and I just said, oh, whatever I got to do. I don't know what that means. I don't know what, whatever I got to do means, but that's what I'll do. And even if it's uncomfortable or, or foreign or like, uh, you know, I don't know how to do it. I'll ask, I'll ask, but that's what I'm going to do. And, uh, I haven't had a drink since. And that was July 30th, 1988. You know, it's, it's not been challenge free, but that's been the concept that willingness. And they talk about it so much throughout the book, you know, that, that uh, upon that foundation of complete willingness, you know, step one is the the hundred percent step. The twelve and twelve says, you know, everything else is just ideals or beacons that I try to go towards. But um, yeah, so I, I out of that desperation, and I I was really lost for a while. I I I, uh, I was not very effective, or uh, but I had this suddenly. I had this spark of hope. See, a few months earlier, I went to see this doctor with my my music teacher, and uh, my music teacher was probably in his. Well, he's probably as old as I am now, if not older. And I was a young man of early early twenties, and we both saw this doctor uh, regarding some some nerve pain. And the doctor looked at my teacher, and he looked at me. And the doctor said, "It's funny." He says, "I don't see a spark with you." And that kind of stuff you don't forget. Well, I when I, I came back came back day, and I got my spark back. And I, I'll tell you, when I walked into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was an old man. I'm I'm younger now than I was 35 years ago. I just felt so hopeless, you know. So the, the desperation led me uh, to do two things, uh, many things, but I'm going to talk about two of them in particular. Uh, one was that I decided that I would just get my hands on the AA literature and, and recordings. You know, but everything that I can find a literature wise, not just the books, but the booklets, the grapevines, the pamphlets, any and all of it. And I'd read it. And if there's anything in that literature that I was in disagreement with, and there was, I I just reminded myself that it's correct and I'm I'm wrong. Just that's just the way it is. Because I knew my thinking was screwed. Like I knew that it was just it was they talk in the in the literature about this violent mental twist and this warp. You know, and I knew I couldn't fix my warp thinking with my warp thinking. The mechanism shot. I knew I, I, I had, I needed some help there. I needed a lot of help there beyond me. So yeah, that's just the way it, the way it was and the way it is. And I've never regretted that decision. The A literature is sound. It's not just a bunch of monkeys in a room with a typewriter. You know, it's well thought out by men and women over you know decades that have thought this through, you know. Bill was very deliberate about the words he used. Extremely deliberate. Just a, a craftsman with with his words. Intentional, you know. 
precise. And um, I, 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 for me, the AE literature is like an inside shower. It's just always been that way. I, I feel so comfortable with it. Uh, it was it was quite foreign at the beginning uh concepts in there that i'd never considered um but i just did it you know i started to apply it not just read it and study it uh, and not just talk about it but to try and apply it you know as best i could and ask a lot of questions from others who were who were just as passionate you know the other thing i did is i forgot to mention my quest for happiness and there there might be some happiness junkies here uh in in my you know, before I I found AA, I was just in this search for happiness and peace, and uh, a lot of a lot of books, a lot of self help books, and I was no closer to happiness than I than when I started the quest. When I came to you, I read a lot of great books uh, with a lot of you know a lot of great first chapters, anyways, and uh, I just it just eluded me. I had no idea, and then I came to you, and you showed me by your words and by your actions that it's not about happiness here. It's about usefulness. I'd never considered that. That if I seek usefulness, then happiness just lands on me. And then I can have it all. <laughs> I, I I would have never stumbled upon that in a million years. And you just showed me how that works. You know, that's, you know, like I love how Dr. Bob says that this is all about love and service. When you distill the 12 steps down to their simplest, it's just love and service. Like we get to love and serve each other. You know, and and, and uh, you know the the original the original twelve step. We tried to carry this message to others, especially alcoholics. So I I try to like anyone with pulse, anyone with with skin on, you know, uh, try to love and serve as best I can. And uh, there's all, there's no shortage of people to love and serve. When I came to you, I I hated people. I, it's the truth. I just I just did. I I I was just. I I didn't like people at all, and there's just people everywhere, don't you know? <laughs> so the steps, you know, as Clancy says, I I do the steps, and people start to shape up, and then when I slow down, uh, they get out of sorts again. I gotta I gotta get back to it. So you know, I I just tried. The desperation led me to you know look for the happy people in AA, and of course, there's tons of happy people in AA, and people who even beyond happiness, contentment. You know, joy, uh, a sense of a real serenity and and wonder. You know, now we we tend to take turns being happy, uh, but there are some people that are happy almost all the time. You know, and I I stay close and I I I watch you, <laughs> and uh, if I do what you're doing, I'll get what you get. You know, it's just that simple. You know, so yeah, that statement of purpose on seventy seven. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us. So how may I be most useful right here and right now? You know, if I keep that in the front of my mind, when I do that, uh, things are pretty good, you know. It's a whole different way of living for me. So I went to meetings on a regular basis, and uh, I, I loved you right away. I really did. I I uh, never bored in AA. That's for sure. There's always something going on. There's there's sometimes it's drama, sometimes it's comedy, uh, sometimes it's looking like an looking in a funhouse mirror. You know, I'd I'd be thinking, oh look at that guy over there, what a what a joker, and oh I just did that yesterday, isn't that right? You know, just the the judgment. I never realized how judge ju judgmental I was until I I started to do the work. You know, I I, I never laughed at once, not a, not a single time before. Uh, I came in day I except, you know, I, I would laugh at if uh, something happened to you. I, I, I was not, I was not well. Um, so I, I started to greet, you know, and I started to remember names and ask people how they're doing. I didn't really want to ask that, but that's what people said to do. And, and I, I noticed the happy people were doing it. So I did that and I started to be interested, very much interested. And I started to get the center off of me, and that that's taken some doing. That that root, you know, they talk about in step three, you know, selfishness, self-centeredness. You know, it's like alcoholics. We're not the only examples of selfishness or self-will and riot. We're just the extreme ones. So I I didn't uh, realize the depth of that. It says you know the alcoholic doesn't realize that, or though he doesn't uh, think so. Uh, 
and uh, I didn't I didn't get it till I did uh, the fourth and fifth the first time. So I, I got a sponsor within a week. I found him at a speaker meeting and he gave a talk and I thought, wow, this guy's this guy's pretty humble. He's got a gentleness about him, but he's also got a, a quiet confidence and he can laugh at himself. And uh, I nabbed him, you know, and uh, we talked a lot. I phoned him all the time. We went out for coffees and uh, listened to AA talks. I, people gave me tapes uh, of AA speakers all the time. You know, so I listened to one on my ghetto blaster, or my Sony walk when I'm dating myself here. And I would listen to him on the, on the subway or on the bus or in the bathtub, whatever. Um, you know, I was up in Montreal all the time and, and many of the tapes I got were, were from our chair here. I, 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 I'm, I knew of Glenn years before I, I met him and so thankful for so many of his tapes and all those conferences. I, I, I learned, I learned to laugh at myself and, and, uh, really got deeper with those, you know? So yeah, I've got a home group right away as well. And, uh, I was just, I was always there and like to get there early, leave late, quite early, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes before and help set up. And, you know, I, I find the people that are there early and late are the servants of AA and, I really like bumping elbows with the servants. I learn a lot about how to live well. I, I learn a lot about, you know, because I'd always always been awkward with people. Always, you know, feeling less than. And and uh, I, people just accepted me for, for who I was. They didn't say, you need to be this way or you should do this. They just said, we're, we're glad you're here. You know, come as you are. They didn't say that, but that's the way they acted. And that's that's what I owe, uh, you know. That's that's the way I need to treat people. I it was I was difficult to love back then, you know. And um, people loved me anyways. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I got into my steps uh, as outlined in the big book. I I love the twelve and twelve. I think it's a a great text. There's no but here. I am gonna say that what what the purpose of each, each book is and. This isn't me trying to play expert. This is what Bill said uh, in the forward to 12 and 12. He talks about how, you know, he wrote both books, so he should know, right? And the, the big book was written, you know, he was just about three or four years sober when he started to write it. And uh, the 12 and 12, it came out in, in 1952, 1953. Um, but he said in the forward to 12 and 12, he said the original volume, the, the big book, uh, shows the application of the steps to the alcoholic's dilemma. Uh, application doing, you know, and then he says this present volume, this 12 and 12 that you're reading, uh, proposes to broaden and deepen your understanding of the steps as laid out in the, in the original volume. So, you know, the purpose of big book is that shows me how to do my steps. And then the 12 and 12, if I want to understand them a little bit deeper. So they're, they're complementary. They're not uh, competitive. You know, the, they're not contradictory. They're, they're complementary. So I do my, my steps and I sponsor out of the big book. Um, you know, for example, six and seven, they really are as simple as, as those two paragraphs on 76. I, I, I spent so much time trying to find a more complicated way to do those. I thought it can't be just a paragraph each. There's just no way. He just didn't write enough about it. Yeah, he did. It really is that simple. It's not easy. But, um, you know, so... Um, the, you know, the first step, the complete powerless, like I'm not going to go through them all in, in complete detail. There's, there's not, uh, not enough time, but I, I got a lot of help with them. I went to a lot of big book meetings and workshops and uh, the Charlie and I got to see Charlie and Joe three times. I couldn't, I got to see them in, in, in three cities and um, so fortunate as well as listening to their talks on, on tapes and then other big book workshops as well over the years. But, uh, you know, step one, it's just a statement of the problem. And it's an absolute. You know, I, I find there's very few absolutes in life except mainly God, really. God is the the only thing that, that is constant. Well, I guess the other thing that's constant is change. Things are, I can count on there being constant change. So, you know, um, th that is an absolute. I'm powerless, not powerless on Tuesdays, not powerless if not kind of powerless. I'm completely powerless 
over alcohol. That's because of the two, you know, the twofold, the, the mental obsession and the physical allergy. And that physical allergy I talked about earlier, right? When, I, when it's in my body, it doesn't matter what the content of it is. If it's 0.5 or if it's a 80 proof, it doesn't matter how much I drink. If it's in my body in any form, in any amount, I'm off to the races. It's a physical craving that cannot be overcome. And I can't crave a drink unless I've had a drink. So that's the craving. Now, if that's all I had, there's no problem here. I just don't drink, right? Like the, the diabetic doesn't crave sugar. The, their body doesn't process sugar properly. And they just don't, they, they manage that, you know, even though their body's designed differently, mine's designed differently. Um, there's no problem here. But my problem is is the obsession, you know, that, that uh, you know, forgets the the suffering of, a, you know, just, just recently. And uh, I, you know, the main problem centers in my mind. So I, I can't change my body. That's just my chemical makeup. That's my hormones. That's my enzymes. That's just the way my body's made. It cannot be changed. Science hasn't found a way. There's there's no, it's not a valium deficiency. There's no way to, to change this. But my mind is the is the is where the hope is. But I can't, I gotta bring my mind to its creator. You know, if 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 I drive a Ford car and it breaks down, I don't bring it to, to a Toyota dealership. And there's nothing wrong with Toyota Toyota repair shops if I'm driving a Toyota. <laughs> you know, they're going to get, they're going to sort of fix it. They might get close to doing a good job, but the best place to bring it back is to the to the creator, to the source. And that's the same thing with my mind. So, you know, so if I'm powerless, I need power with a capital P. Uh, and I don't just need a higher power. I need the highest power. I need something that's more powerful than me more powerful than alcohol and more powerful than all the other negative powers out there. And, um, you know, we're not even talking about what that power is yet. We're not there yet, but I'm beyond human aid without help. It is too much for me. Yeah. So, uh, and I've got, I don't have any effective mental defense when I drive. If I don't check my blind spot, sometimes I'm going to be okay, but not all the time. <laughs> and I don't know when those times are going to be when I'm not going to be okay. There's that strange mental blank spot with alcohol. That was that's what was going on with me, without any steps, you know. So you know, so in my life's unmanageable. That nothing to do with alcohol. The unmanageability comes. It's just because of I'm spiritually unsound, you know. Uh, I've got the root of selfishness and self-centeredness, and I. They talk about the bedevilments on fifty-two. The signs of a of untreated alcoholism, you know, uh, the signs of uh, the symptoms of an unmanageable life. And I had those in spades. I had them all, you know, dot, you know, check them all off. Right. And I, I, I bring those up with my guys, you know, Bill talks about in, in on page eight, you know, those first page, first eight pages of his story are his descent to his bottom. You know, it's, a, it's really step one, you know, he's talked about, you know, quicksand stretched around him in all directions. I'd met my match. I'd been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master, and I was its slave. You know, I, I put myself into a straight jacket. I don't know how I did it, but I couldn't get myself out of it. Nothing to do with drinking, just just a unmanageable life. So I need to fire the manager. <laughs> I need to get new management. So uh, I need to divorce from myself. So, you know, I need the power in step two, you know, and uh, it's a... What I did is I, I asked people how to pray. I didn't know how to pray. So I asked them, you know, what, what did you do? And they said, well, I, here's, here's I, this one guy. I remember seeing this guy on a bus. And I don't think I ever saw him again after this conversation. Like, this conversation was key. I might have been three months sober or something at the time. And I said, well, well how do you pray? And he said, well, he says, just ask God that he reveal himself to you. You know, and ask God to give you an ever-increasing faith in him and ask God to remove the obsession to drink. And I did those three things, like on a regular basis, multiple times a day, every day. You know, God, whoever you are, would you please reveal yourself to me? And would you grant me an ever-increasing faith in you? And please, if you would, if it be your will, remove the obsession from me. He did all three things. 
and it it was funny how it, it happened like i started to to see and hear things exactly when i needed to see and hear them from the strangest sources <laughs> you know i just needed to be open and i started to you know and, and they'd be said in a way that that would be palatable to me i and i became open had some amazing conversations with people in aa and outside of aa and continue of course to have those kind of kind of conversations just key conversations You know, one of them uh, with the with the God stuff. You know, um, the uh, I was at a meeting with a with a guy who was about the same length of sobriety as me, and he said, I, I asked him, I said, "What what's God for you?" And he, we were both looking at at some trees, and he says, uh, for him, it was uh, the the tops of trees blown in the wind, that that's where he felt the presence of the higher power, and for me, it's uh, watching seagulls how the seagulls use the wind. They don't fight it. They they use it. They they go with it. And I was anything but flowing. Like all I knew before A was was fight or flee. And and through your example, I've learned a little by little to face and flow. So that conversation was you know almost thirty five years ago or around that. I still remember him every time I see a seagull or the top of a tree blowing the wind. I think of him and I think of that conversation. You know, and uh, that's just the impact these. these things have on me it's it's all about connections and and i mentioned the wonder and the awe i had never had experience with wonder or awe before or joy and you know i started to laugh i started to laugh with my belly you know and i started to laugh at myself scared myself to death the first time i laughed because it'd been a long time and i'm usually laughing the loudest especially at myself you know and yeah so so step three just made a decision i'm gonna i'm I, you know uh I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to step three though because there's something I want to talk about, but four and five I I you know the inventory four right after three, you know and uh, now that's not the way I did it originally. It took me a year before I did my first fourth. I was just too scared, but uh, I finally did it at a monastery, and my fifth right after my fourth, and I for anyone who hasn't done a fourth and fifth, if if you don't want to change for goodness sakes, do not do a fourth and fifth. It it total. I could never be the same again. I started to see patterns, you know. I I saw some stuff that I couldn't or wouldn't see before. Uh, I saw that you know th there are no idiots in this world. There's just people who are spiritually sick. We're all spiritually sick to some degree or another. And how can I be angry at the spiritual sickness? And if I resent you for doing this behavior, I mean the chances are I've done that same behavior, or something similar. to you or to someone else and now i'm faced with a choice i can be angry at you and me or i can be forgiving of you and me but i got to choose one or the other i can't you know be angry at you and forgiving of me or vice versa and i choose forgiveness and self-forgiveness you know so you know five i brought it to my sponsor i brought god into it um at you know and um that that fourth column where we you know we were we were prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle a new attitude a new angle of approach. Could it be that I was seeing it incorrectly? Oh, yeah. So whenever I, I'm disturbed now, I just consider I don't have all the information I need here. I'm filling in the blanks with stuff that makes me look better and them look worse, you know, and that's not the way I want to live. That doesn't work. I don't, I don't want to live in anger, and I'm, I'm going to do whatever I, I, I have to, so to, to not live that way. So six and seven, just more prepare and execute, you know. Uh, I, I say, uh, God, if you would, uh, I'm asking, would you uh, remove these defects? I mean, the prep beforehand, how did I become willing? How did I become entirely willing? It was through pain. Pain's a great persuader. And originally it was because I didn't want to feel the pain, but it was there was a higher motive eventually, which was, I don't want to cause anyone else any pain anymore. I don't want to be that person. It hurts when I hurt someone else. I'm hurting my brother or sister. And that it's not it's not the design, it's not the way we're meant to live. So you know, I I bring it to God, and you you know whatever stands in the way, you you remove, you take the defects you want, uh, when you want, how you want, yeah, whatever speed you want, and uh, whatever's left is what's meant to be today, and that's going to change tomorrow. So you know, I'm I'm the clay, and he's the potter. Signed, sealed, delivered. And I'm yours. Whatever you want, God. Eight and nine are the only steps taken together. You know, I make the uh, harms list in step eight. I got that for my step four, didn't I? So, 
and I take that list to my sponsor and he turns that into an amends list. You know, every, I, every single one I go through every single name and, uh, there are some of them I thought I needed to go to. And he said, no, you don't because could harm that person there. And there's some that I didn't think I should go to. And he says, Oh yes, you should. <laughs> so I ordered them from easiest to hardest and I started to do them. And the person that I became at the end of the ninth was so much different from the person I was at the start of the eighth, you know, and I got my willingness by doing each amend and the willingness increased so that the hard ones that almost looked impossible, they became possible and doable and done. And step 10 is just a continuation of four to nine for me. You know, I, I continue to work on those on, you know, when I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. I need to look at that. Not morally wrong, just incorrect belief systems, incorrect attitudes, some feelings that, uh, that don't add up. And uh, I bounce them off someone. I take them in prayer. Step 11, prayer and meditation, you know, uh, just to get still and silent and available at his disposition. And uh, step 12, the ultimate promise. You know, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, these these steps written before, um, I tried to carry this message. Well, what's this message? And this message is, that word this is a referring word. So this message is something that's just been said. Hey, everyone, uh, I've, I've had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. That's the message. It's It really is, for me, it's that simple. Uh, that I'm, I, I've been changed. There's still lots of work to be done, but the, the, I'm, the desire to drink has been removed. I live differently. I think differently. Um, you know, I cause less harm, and when I do, I amend it quicker than I used to. I never amended anything before. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and I try to practice these principles. Well, what are these principles? Well, that word "these" is a referring word again. The steps that were just laid out. It's not. It's 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 just that the principles are the steps. I try to practice these steps in all my affairs. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to just quickly go back to something in in three that was really crucial for me, and then we'll land this plane. And I I uh, there's something that let me just find it here in uh, sixty to sixty three the the narrative of the step three. Uh, the last time I did it formally with my sponsor, we did it out loud in first person. And it just changed everything. And that's the way I do it when I, when I sponsor now. So I'll, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but listen to the language of some of this. So being convinced I was at step three, which is that I decided to turn my will and my life over to God as I understood him. Well, just what do I mean by that? And just what do I do? The first requirement is that I be convinced that any life run, that my life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, I'm almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though my motives are good. I try to live by self-propulsion. I'm like an actor who wants to run the whole show, forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, and the rest of the players in my own way. If my arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as I wished, the show would be great. So everybody, especially me, would be pleased. Uh, life would be wonderful. My life would be wonderful. In trying to make these arrangements, I might be quite virtuous sometimes. I might be kind, considerate, patient, you know, and that whole rest of that paragraph. But what usually happens, uh, the show doesn't come off very well. That's for sure. And uh, this was drinking or sober. Uh, I, I begin to think that life doesn't treat me right. I decide to exert myself more. You know, still the play doesn't suit me. Admitting I may be someone at fault, I'm sure that other people are more to blame. And then I become angry, indignant, self-pitying. What is my basic trouble? Well, that sentence got my attention. What's wrong with me? And here it is. Am I not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? Am I not a victim of the delusion that I can rest, you know, with force, try to get satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well? And isn't it evident to all the rest of the players, to all of you, that these are the things that I want? And do not my actions make each of you wish to retaliate, snatching all I, all I can get out of the show? Yeah. Am I not, even in my best moments, a producer of confusion rather than harmony? So, you know, this just the whole thing really, 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 uh, you know, my troubles are basically of my own making. Yeah, and I'm an extreme example of self run riot, though I usually don't think so. So, and then the third step promises, you know, that they talk about, you know, the, before that, the, the new and triumphant arch through which I passed, not to relief, not to survival, but to blessed freedom. 
finally freedom of spirit. You know. So, yeah, the third step promise is top of 63. And then that third step, and I'll just close with this. You know, um, someone brought it out as like a conversation. So listen to the language of this. God, I offer myself to you. Well, why? To build with me and to do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self. Well, why? Well, they, that I may better do your will. And take away my difficulties. Well, why? That victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your all, your will. When? Always. Yeah, I took that with my sponsor, and he took his. And uh, one last thing on, on that third step prayer. And as Bill sees it, you know, he wrote that in 67. And um, in he, what it is is a compilation of a lot of his writings, right? Including big book writings, including this third step. And he said in the forward to As Bill Sees It, which was called the AA Way of Life back then, he said, some of these things, I've altered some of the phrases and words. And one of them, you know, that third step prayer, he says, take away my difficulties that my transcendence over them may bear witness. So he changed victory to my transcendence. And I just love how his spiritual life evolved to that. I, I love the concept of transcendence instead of victory. You know, we, we cease fighting anyone and anything. And I think I'm going to stop with that. And I really, really appreciate um, everyone here and, uh, and Glenn for the opportunity to serve and wish everyone a, a wonderful day of love and service. Thank you.